Now, the recommended test that I recommend that clinicians do, and this has changed over the years, is to make sure you do your testosterone test. The, uh, the Society of Endocrinologists recommends two morning testosterone tests separated by time, and both of them may well do. I do this in my practice? No. If they're clinically symptomatic, and I have a low testosterone, that's one of the reasons I put them on testosterone therapy. But the other one that Dr. Flavio was talking about was I look at the free level of testosterone. That's the one to get the guys coming in who have both have all the symptoms. Their testosterone is 500. Their doctor says they won't put them on testosterone. You get the free level and it's four because they have too much binding protein. And for those gentlemen, that's good enough. I have no problem with giving them testosterone therapy. Rule of thumb: the lower the testosterone, the free testosterone is, the better they're going to have on the effects of the symptomatology when you give them testosterone therapy. So you know, I look at the binding protein, I look at the estrogen level, I don't treat my estrogen level unless the patient is symptomatic, nipple tenderness, prostate issues, but I do monitor their estrogen levels. We look at the PSA, and these are all the levels that they were prior on average on our judgment that we're putting in the levels. We always look at a CBC, we never know which ones we're going to be giving injection to, we want to know what the hemoglobin level is, we always check the cholesterol, always improve with testosterone therapy if given physiologically. We look at their glucose level, their insulin, their BUM, all the standard things. Here's two new ones. We've instituted in the last three years our policy that all gentlemen are now getting factor two and factor five measurements before we put in public therapy. Why is this? There is not a lot of literature yet out on the antiphospholipids factor two and factor five. However, clinical experience has shown us especially since all the publications came out with the myth that testosterone causes heart attacks and stroke. When you get a guy who has a non-testosterone therapy and they have an embolic event, the, the cardiologist will look at you, and this is what happened to me, and they will say, did you do a factor five and factor two before you put on testosterone therapy? So it just makes sense. It's like, you know, this is a good idea, because if we have a polymorphism of factor two or factor five, then we can have that open conversation with the patient, although the risks associated with it are not yet known, we can have that open conversation. And it makes for a, it's it just another uh, kudo to have in your range. Those are the pet, how do you go to public therapy on campus? It's very simple. Let's not make this complicated. 750 to 800 is our starting point. That range may be varying from 400 to 1,500 over time, but our typical range is 750. Now that would be if we're using the 75 milligrams of the test of health, or 800 if we're using four of the compounded 200 milligram pellets. But we reduce it by one to two test of health or a full 200 milligram compounded testosterone pellet for any pre-existing mental disease. For anything, for the patients that are over 65, for the patients with the lower body weight, or a higher percentage body fat, and the less active. So what we always say is older, fatter, leaner, slower. You can always put another pellet in sooner. But if you go too high, you got to ride out the effects. Who starts everything? We increase it. If the guy is just the opposite, if he's younger, higher body weight, higher muscle mass, lower body fat percentage, or very active, or very stressed. Now, I want to back up for a second. We're talking about the pre existing disease, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, cancer. I have no problem putting in testosterone health therapy with the talk with their oncologist. But if uh, I should also put in that we also consider pre existing disease inflammation. But they got the bad guy, they got the inflammatory markers, they're going to need less initially. Although on the back side, they need to build the tank. The other thing that you're going to know about the stop therapy after you've done it long enough, somewhere around 12 to 18 months, you're suddenly going to need to drop your dose. The tank's got to be full, and the maintenance dose needs more. Just like the gym there, Letty was talking about with the women on the top of the pole, initially for the first couple of weeks, you need to let them down more, and then they taper down the guys on the top because of the particle connection. You're going to see about 12 months into it that you subdivide, you can get them as much, or while wow, that can wait instead of four months, now you can wait to six months before putting in the next, next inside of colors. This is our standard consent to treat. You have no permission to review if your lawyer did you 
ways to adapt to do so. And this is a good talking point that I give to all my guys to say, take this, take it home, read it, come back and we'll talk about this. Because what we talked about is all the things we just talked about here. And it's a couple pages long. It talks about convulsions, it talks about infections. So let's get into the deep details here, shall we? Talk about how to put it out of there. For those that are task oriented and have the office there, you want to know exactly what you want, Dr. Shadow, so have a couple put in, here's your list. So the first thing we're going to do is go for a couple graphs. So what we're going to do is we have an exam day collection, we have a little dense on the tree in our office, we put the power over, and the patient lays it down with their head up to one end and they're facing the wall. So that what you're seeing is you're standing behind this patient. You're behind the patient here. And what we're going to do then is we're going to just find some landmarks. And what you're looking for is a bank deposit right above the superior iliac crest. You're not really injecting, you're not really putting them in the buttons, like everybody said. You need to think you will make incisions in the body and then we'll go step left. Because what we're looking to do is get it in the fatty tissue right near the iliac crest. It's not in the muscle itself. So you position the patient, you swap it with alcohol, you cut, you cut the area, and you've already, already injected lidocaine with that. How much? You don't think it's about a milliliter for guy. You don't have to need to use anything more than a milliliter of lidocaine. A method plate sharply incising into the skin at a 90 degree angle. You want to go through the dermis. You have the dermis in the dermis. And then we'll show how to accept that to assemble the trocar set, which comes in three parts. You have your trocar, you have your stylet, and you have your operator, or what we call the muscle motion. Uh, so what you do is you go straight, once you have the incision with the 11 plate, you put the belt end of the trocar inside, and you go 90 degrees in the skin, you go straight down in until you pass the dermis, then you clock it. So you're about 45 degrees into the skin. Then slide pressure upwards, and the trocar will slide easily in. So once the trocar is in, you pull this dinette out, you load in the pellets, and then you put them into the operator. And we do not use, we use a band-aid to hold our wounds. We don't use carry strips. We certainly don't stitch it. You're going to get more infections than you're than it just leaving it open. What's the number? What's the, there have been multiple studies. What's the number one cause of why pellets pop out and infections occur? The time that it takes the doctor to put in the pellet. The quicker you're in, the quicker you're out. The sooner you do it, the lower your rates. And in our office, our clinicians are not allowed to do this procedure by themselves. And they can demonstrate they can do the procedure from skin to skin in 30 to 60 seconds. Because if you ever sit around and around with all this stuff and don't think you're going to get it, the infection rate climbs exponentially, I'm sorry, linearly with the time the wound is being played. So now we're going to talk about the, we're going to go through a video presentation. This is actual, uh, actual patients. If we can, Preparation for the implantation of testosterone pellet in men is fairly simple. So simple that a clinician can do the implantation on the patient by himself. What the, patient, what the clinician wants to have available for the patient is very simply an implantation set which includes a tray, a sterile tray, and then next to this is the trocar set. The trocar set has three individual, set, individual components to it which we'll identify later, which are the trocar, the stylet, and the plunger. Having the 11 blade available, as well as having the testosterone pellets on the table as to be determined on the amount that the, the physician wants to implant on the patient. Sterile gloves and a mask are mandatory. Gauze, tape, betadine, and a towel. So what we're looking for here is the fatty deposit that occurs in the area above the gluteus major, which is this area up here. Almost all guys carry some fat above the gluteus. We're not going to go into the gluteus muscle itself. 
So first off, what we do is use a sanitized area for in preparation for the numbing medication, which we use a 1% Lido with or without epi. Uh, with this gentleman, we're going to be using it with epinephrine. Picking the area knowing we're going to implant here in a caudal direction. We just put a small amount of lidocaine. I'm using one, mil one cc. Too often clinicians, I believe, use a little bit too much lidocaine, which is usually not required. We want to make sure we get a good skin, skin weld raising on the skin. Here it goes. And then we will be inserting the pellet in this direction. We're, not, we're going at an angle about, from about 30 degrees to 45 degrees from the base of the skin. And we're going to let that numb up for a few moments. We open the sterile container. With the sterile tray. And the trocar set. Then you take the testosterone pellets. You put them into the sterile tray. You take your 11 blade, put that in the sterile tray. Here, focus, come here. And we take the fenestrated drape. Overlay it on the area that's already been prepped. Apply our face mask. Now we're ready to go and you're going to see how we can do this without any assistance needed from a medical assistant. Putting your gloves on. The key to the uh, a successful procedure is making sure the area is well, well anesthetized as well as speed. The studies show that, the, that people who have the most rapid in and out rate have the least amount of infection. So we're taking the 11 blade perpendicular to the skin, inserting it about a half of about a centimeter down and making an incision that's no more than a half a centimeter in length. We take the trocar we insert the stylet so that the bevels meet. We go perpendicular to the wound down until we pass the dermis area, then we angle it at a 35 degree, 30 to 45 degree angle, and with a slight improvement push of the trocar, which takes a just a little bit of pressure, it should slide right in. You then remove the stylet, take the pellets, Insert the pellets, one, two, and three into the slot. Take your plunger at the end, which is the flat end, push lightly up and they slide right in and pull your trocar out and the procedure is done. And that's it. That's, uh, everybody's now an expert at putting in pellets there. This is a procedure now, as I mentioned, you're welcome to review it. This is the discharge handout that we give to every patient who has a pellet. Talk about the pain at the surgery site, the possibility of bleeding, the infection, as well as the pellet popping out and some of the side effects of the hormones. Follow-up testing, one month after the first implantation, we repeat our levels. Because we know that the pellets last for about 60 to 60, 65 days. So if you're measuring within that 30 day period, you'll know which levels they are. Typically, this is the levels that we have. And if I have more time, I'll present the study we did on the guys we did at what we call moderate dose for high dose pellet therapy. We got better results with the moderate dose. So we have a goal range of somewhere between seven, six, 600 to 1,000 30 days after the pellets. The PSA doesn't change, actually they come down a little bit, the mattress doesn't change. And about 100, about 90 to 120 days before you're putting in the next pellet, if you have the need, you're going to see a little bit lower on the testosterone levels, a little bit lower on the free levels. So the takeaway from this is one month after the pellet implant, you should notice a symptomatic improvement in testosterone levels. 
get a normal range, start low, it's always the same adage, start low, go slow, go higher on those patients that need that. You don't need to dose to the upper 25% to get good physiological responses. In fact, you saw less physiological responses the higher you went over certain points. Pellet expulsions, 0.3 to 12% of the time. Pain at a certain site, common but really not a problem. Infections at insertion site, again, I've had one patient in 15 years and then with the cellulitis. I have thousands and thousands of public implant epithetiness, bleeding site, and these all talk about our typical initial remedies for each of these complications. Implant about every four to five months. The guys will tell you when their pellets are out, because they'll usually tell you before they get the lab does it back. And we adjust the dose accordingly, one more pellet or one lower pellet, depending on your symptom metabolism. I'm happy to answer any questions outside the room afterwards, and I thank you for listening to the presentation.